the Motion Picture Association and ratings. What's happening with your film? How do you feel about the NC-17 rating? And then I want to ask everybody else what you've had to change in your films, fairly or unfairly. Yeah, I mean, I was uh, I was shocked when I heard that that you know Blue Valentine received received the NC-17 because uh, you know th the intention with the film was always to make something that was honest and respectful to people and to an audience and try to present the audience with situations that uh, they could see in their in their life. You know what I mean? Not in a fantastical way, but in a in kind of an authentic way. You know, and uh, and to have uh, you know to have the film get slapped with that. I mean. You know, if you've seen the film, there's not, it doesn't show a lot. Um, I don't think we got that rating for what we show. I think we got it for how we made people feel, you know, and I think we put them into sometimes uncomfortable and very intimate places. And, you know, so in some ways, it's a, I see it as a compliment, you know, and it's been great to have, like, the, the support from the industry and from uh, fans, you know, and from the media that, that have come, you know, come out in defense of our film. But it's also a great insult because it's it's insulting to, you know, me as a filmmaker, to my actors who you know really put themselves out and put themselves in these really raw, uh, you know, uh, vulnerable places, and to have this uh, this body that basically is telling them that no, that's too much, that's too raw, pull back on it. And I think it's insulting to an audience to say that uh, to say that the audience shouldn't see this because it's really not. I mean, I consider it to be you know they give it the NC-17. And they're trying to, they don't think we would ever release the film as NC-17. So in some ways they're trying to censor. So are you going to release it as NC-17 or what? I mean, we're still appealing. You know, we're still in, in our appeal and, and hopefully we can, you know, win that appeal. You know, I think, uh, you know, I think, I think we should be able to. I think there's enough precedent for... Would you make cuts point. if you don't? No, we have, we've had no really? discussion about that. And, you know, I feel very fortunate right now to have you know, the, the actors on, on the side of, of the film defending it, the audience on the side. And I got, you know, with Harvey Weinstein, he's, a, he's like a great fighter, that guy. And he, uh, you know, it's great to have him on the side of our film, you know, and trying to respect the audience, you know. I but don't your category is saying that if Harvey comes to you and says, we can't get around this, you have to make cuts, you're not going to do that. Well, we've never talked about it. Yeah, it's, it's never even been discussed, you know, the idea of making cuts. Because, you know, honestly, what would the audience do then? I mean, if we're, you know, if right now we have so much support from people that, 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 uh, that are fighting for us, you know, if, if we go back and cave into the NC-17 rating and water our film down, then who would ever want to see that film after that? Do you know what I mean? Uh, John Wayne has that line in, uh, I think, The Quiet Man, where he says, when I drink whiskey, I drink whiskey, and when I drink water, I drink water, you know? And I don't want to make this a whiskey and water movie. It should be <laughs> pure whiskey. <laughs> yes. You know? Tom, you've had uh, sort of, I, I heard you were surprised with the rating you got. What, what, <coughs> what, what, what happened there? Uh, we got an R rating because um, of 17 uses of the word fuck. So I'm just giving this an R rating online. Yes. <laughs> um, and what I found extraordinary about it is, is, is that word in this film is used in a, in a therapeutic context. It's not being used in its sexual, for its sexual meaning. It's not being used in its aggressive meaning. It's being used entirely as a release mechanism in the context of speech therapy. Um, the technique, my, my writer David Seidler was actually taught it uh, as a kid in the 1940s and it seemed to be fine for a child in the 1940s to be taught to swear to get over uh, this, you know, this, this speech block. Apparently not now. And what I find specious about the argument, I mean, the argument goes that you have to judge violence contextually, but you cannot judge language contextually. And yet you could say, well, one bullet through the head is a PG-13, two or more bullets through the head is an R. I mean, you know, you could say, uh, you know, once, you know, kill, killed with one stab wound is a PG-13, 37 stab wounds is an R. I mean, they were, they were, you could argue you could quantify violence as well. Um, but, but the rule is that if it's one fuck, it's PG-13, two fucks or more, it's an R. Um, and, I, you know, and, I, and I find it kind of extraordinary that you can't um, take context into account. In the UK we've had this amazing victory where they've, they've given us a, um, a 12A which is kind of like a PG-13 and the, the certificate at the front of the movie actually says uh, you know contains strong language used in the context of speech therapy. You know so so there's no precedential problem because unless you're a filmmaker you making a film the, with strong the language. The certifying board 
use that language, yes, yeah, not you. To explain it, How yeah. interesting. Well, just to, so, that, so that you can't invoke precedent and go, well, we've got the F word, why can't we use it? And, and what, I find, what I find strange is I've, I cannot think of a single time that, that language has caused me any kind of repetitive trauma after seeing a movie. I can't think of a single, single film where that's the case, but there are cases even at my age of films where you know visual violent imagery has stayed with me in an unwelcome way. I mean the Bond movie where you know Daniel Craig gets his bollocks smashed in through a chair with no bottom in a torture scene that's PG-13. You know the, the beginning of Salt where Angelina Jolie has a plastic tube forced down her throat and then water poured into it to simulate drowning that's a PG-13. Both of those images have stayed with me in a way that I'd actually rather be, have rid of uh, and, and that's considered more you know less problematic. Um, uh, than the language. So this does seem to be an extraordinary permissiveness in terms of um, violence coming into us. And I, I mean, you know, it's, it's funny because I'm sitting at a table with a filmmaker who made a scene um, that stayed with, with me in this way, which is that scene in Witness, you know, in, in the loo. Uh, and, it, and I think I said to you, so we met in Telluride, and I said there hasn't, there hasn't been a time that I go to an airport loo or a train station loo without absolutely being, seeing the experience through the prism of that scene. Mm. Now I worked out, I think I was actually 16 when I saw that film, and yet it was, it was so powerful that it's, that it's lived with me for the rest of my life. And I, and, and I think, you know, one of the things about, about violence is, it, is to the young mind it has an extraordinary ability to, to, to colonise your imagination. And that's, I think, the thing that needs to be kind of respected in terms of young people. And it's almost a kind of misrecognition of the power of cinema um, to, be, to be so to lax about violence compared to language. Did you appeal in this case? Uh, we, 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 I think we're in the process of it, but I don't think we're going to get it. Have you had your fights, Peter? Uh, not of late. I, I did, uh, I think, with television more in this country, oh. uh, with nudity. Um, and I can only recall uh, one, one that I thought was really just, you know, a kind of inversion of mm -hmm. what they were on about, which was uh, in a film of mine called The Year of Living Dangerously, and mm -hmm. there was a death scene uh, where a child had died. Uh, his mother was a kind of, uh, you know, very poor woman. And so I went along with the ritual that, that they observe uh, in Indonesia. And the naked child is laid out and they sort of break his cooking bowl and, you know, there are flowers around him, they dribble some water on him. So he was lying on his back, the actor. He was about eight, seven or eight parents were there, the usual thing. And, you know, that, that was the scene. And so I was stunned when, you know, it came back for US television, it had to be cut because it was male nudity. And I thought that was a scene, that mm. they would look at, look at the scene in a, in a, in a sexual way. Mm. Um, so Is America yeah. different than the rest of the world from that point of view then? As far as it was the last time I had any contact. Yeah, the very, very tough on nudity. No. but not violence. I, do, I know, it's extraordinary that there is this... <coughs> they permit extraordinary violence and yet uh, won't permit basic nudity. Um, to play devil's advocate, though, um, given the influence of film, don't you think that there has to be a line drawn somewhere? Because, for instance, uh, the use of the word fuck uh, the level of violence that's part of society are so great that don't you think you all, to some degree, contribute to that? Uh, I think the violence thing, by the violence sex thing is all backwards in America. But viol even violence and the rules with the violence uh, with the MPAA is flipped too. You know, in a PG-13 film, you can show violence that has no consequences unlimited so you can do you know the old a team violence that we would see on tv with bullets flying everywhere but i you know not see what a bullet actually does mm. personally i'd rather show a child what yeah. a bullet actually does to someone what a bullet actually sounds like when it's you know ejected from a gun because i think that will actually teach people you know what's really going on with weapon weaponry and so um you know, but as soon as you show blood flying, that's when it becomes rated R. So it's, it's all flipped, even, even with violence. Is there anything you wouldn't show on film? Is there anything I wouldn't show on yeah. film? 
I, I'm not, I haven't run, run into that issue. Well, I actually <laughs> remember when you did The Wrestler. Well, there was a double end. Yeah. Oh, no, you did do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a lot to tell. Well, how would... I ran, I, yeah, I ran into did that. Did you get a PG? Did you get an R for that film, or did you Requiem? have to cut? Yeah. No, Requiem for a Dream was released in NC-17, oh, which well. was a disaster. Mm. Um, and did they talk to you about... And exactly how you should cut it to get that R. Yeah, they, they did. They yes. said you can't show, you can't show contraception going on dildos. <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> did they? And did you literally, say, well, what if they said you cannot show. They they said exactly that. They said you know, and I was like, well, actually, that's showing. It's actually safe sex. It's actually right. teaching something. There's you yes. know, there's you know, sexual toys that are being passed around, and kind of, you know, there's actually a, you know, and and in France we had a 15, you know, so. The, I mean, and I talked a lot about this. It was that documentary by Kirby about Kirby, it. And that, that was my only point was that, you know, it's sex and violence has been flipped in this country where, you know, we were training soldiers, but, uh, you know, you can't show any form of sexuality, which is just ridiculous. I'd rather have my kid exposed to, you know, my kid does not react when he walks down the street and sees the Calvin Klein ads, uh, you know, Eva Mendez looking beautiful mm -hmm. on a huge billboard. He doesn't even notice it. Mm -hmm. It's not an issue for him, but when he sees... You know, that Nikita ad, which was everywhere in New York with that high, with that crazy gun. The four-year-old's like, what's that gun? Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, what are we teaching these kids? And, I, and, and, you know, they say, well, you know, the MPAA argues, well, violence is okay in middle America. But, you know, that's the society we've become where violence is okay and sexuality is completely, we hide from it and we shut it down and we edit I, it. I, I, do, I did find something interesting with the rest, and, and I, I think you know I love the film and just I think it's one of the, one of the best films of the past years mm -hmm. and uh, but I found it extraordinarily brutal and violent and difficult to take and I think maybe at the last round table we did with you you said you didn't find it so <laughs> brutal well, I mean, do you I, still feel that way well, I, I what I said I, I don't know but in context I think what actually goes on in that world it's just the tip of the iceberg and I mean you know, I uh, narr uh, you know, the big violent scene is the scene with the necro butcher and the staple mm. gun and the fork mm. and all that stuff. But I was setting up a heart attack. You know, the the, the actor mm. had to have a heart attack, so I had to show what you know the body went through, and uh, and also I was just trying to represent the truth of what's going on in that world. And it really that's what goes on, and uh, it's kind of what the film's about is you know how these people create vi you know do terrible violent deeds on their bodies to create their art and to get a rise out of the crowd so you know to shed away from it and and similar to what you were saying I, I really identified in Requiem for a Dream you know the studio after we premiered at Cannes to this you know incredible screening um, you know, I had a meal with the studio the next day and they're like well you can't really release it that way mm -hmm. and, and, and the imp entire reason for Requiem for a Dream was to go as far as we could go mm -hmm. because it shows the results of addiction mm -hmm. and it, the second we pulled back from that it undermines exactly what the film what is the about, about yeah. so yeah, exactly. you know and, and there was no way to even argue with the MPA but that was a much different case your case doesn't sound as bad with the yeah. fighter you didn't it didn't to me maybe I'm in your but it didn't seem brutal it seemed that you held back on that was that your own choice or were you pushed by the studio no, it was just the way the way we felt the film was, you know, following the trajectory of Mickey's fights. You know, he gets his face smashed up pretty good, and his brother lived a pretty brutal life, getting smashed up as well. But I thought we did it as accurately as we as we needed to, um, because I, I think I was uh, I I <clears throat> come from the school of cinema that uh, that echoes, uh, which is which is an interesting debate because I come from the school of cinema. Uh, George Lucas said, you know, if you want me to make you feel something, that's not hard. I can, I'll choke a kitten and I'll kill a kitten in front of you and you'll feel something. You'll feel fucked up. And he says what, what's harder to do is to create a dimensionality of a, of a person who is human and is fucked up but also funny, but also sympathetic, but also disliked, um, but also rootable. And, and so, that, so those are the things that I I'm sort of go to as a magnet, you know. Or, or, or the, using the craft angle, you think you saw the kitten strangled. Mm. Yes, mm. right. And, and you say there's no shot of any kitten being strangled, but mm. I swear I saw it. But <laughs> it's the context, the way it was set up, yeah. which is to say during the Hayes mm. Code period, uh, people came up with very inventive ways 
uh, and very creative ways to imply things. You know, look at Hitchcock with the kind of tension between a male and a female. Look at his kisses. I've studied his kisses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, with, with the fight, how restricted were you by budget? Because I, I heard mm. that the initial budget was something like 70 million plus, and then you had to make it for 40 or so. What, what, how, how did that effect? <laughs> I would have liked to have had that. <laughs> that no, no, we were, we were 33 days at uh, 11 below the line. So, you know, so that's like, and we were right around 19. 11 million below the line. Yeah, so we were like around 20. And so, in 33 days. But I actually like that. I come to like that. Why? Because it's just, uh, you have to be really raw and focused and intense and keep moving. There's no room for uh, any, uh, you know, ruminating or second guessing. Um, and listen, you know, if, if you haven't, if you're in, if you're in that, un I was just talking to Tom and saying, you know, how are you? You've made a good film. Uh, what better place is there to be? You know, the only thing that makes me really not that happy, apart from, almost, apart from my, my child, you know, is like, is, uh, if your child's not happy, but is, is, uh, is if your film isn't clicking or your script isn't clicking. That's like you've got a rock in your shoe or like it's sand in your sandwich, you know? So if the film works, you feel like a million bucks, you know? Uh, what question am I answering? <laughs> you, well, it was well, pretty well, good. Well, right, I'm interested in what you had to change because of that budget. Oh, that's what was good about that. The reason we knew what we had was good and that it worked, okay? It was simple. So we knew if that would have been much more torturous if we were trying to look for it. Well, we, that, would have been a, that would have been like sticking needles in my eye if that was like, we, but since we had it and we knew what it was, I knew what the target was and we had it, we could kill it every day. So that, and, and then everybody just has to step up. And there's not room to, to say, oh, I don't know, should it be this way or should it be that way and how should I shoot this? It becomes very instinctual. Right. But were there scenes that you had to cut because of the budget? You know, what's funny, we even, and somebody else said this, uh, Soderbergh said this, even then we still had uh, more footage than we could use. Mm -hmm. And we only could do three takes a day. Very often, I think many people here will agree, maybe not, but you often have much more than you can use. And you're always trying to inoculate yourself because you're trying to avoid that worst nightmare of, why did I shoot so much of this, which I don't need and I'm not even going to use, and why did I not do enough of this, or why didn't I do this, which I wish I could go get right now. That's, like, that's the place you, don't, that you dread in the editing room. But you know, anyway. What was your toughest day on the shoot? Toughest day on the shoot was really, it was three days that was really one, that was one day. And it should have been three days. And it's the opening of the picture, which is, I wanted to create this smash of energy when you meet the brothers in this community of Lowell. And Lowell is a very particular community, and I wanted to just, almost like the beginning of Three Kings, just smash you right into it. And see all these people, and feel the sweat, and feel the... The, the, the black dudes on the street with the cigarettes hanging out of their mouths, giving Dickie his high five, and what a mayor these brothers are to the people of, of this town, to the, uh, the hoi polloi of this town. And so I designed it, it was overly ambitious, and I told everybody we could do it, because I like to shoot on a steady cam, which means we're just gonna run, and we're gonna find our organic shots. And if you work with a great operator, you kind of create a poetry together, and you're like, you kind of look at each other like, okay, we know what's gonna happen now, that's our move there. Now we've broken it into five moves. But we were going through the entire, through this huge section of town. So it was really a three or four or even a week long shot of these, of Mark and Christian and their road crew, because they're road pavers, walking through town, saying hi to all these people in the barber shop, to the drug dealers, to everybody on the street. And I just wanted, I just was so exhausted halfway through. I mean, that's the day where you are, as a director, you are the, 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 uh, Majorette, or whatever you call it, that, that in 76 trombones, what do you call that guy? You have, you have to make it happen, you know, or the train kind of slows down, and you're like halfway through the day, you're like, Jesus, you know, you're like, you know, because it's exhausting, you know, to keep pushing, to make this, the train will go, and it did it, and we got it, but halfway through the day, I was just like, good God, and it was really hot. And my kid was in the scene. This is a hilarious side note. He got to be in the scene. Oh, I shouldn't tell this. No, 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 no. He won't appreciate it. He won't appreciate it. Well, I wanted to get, I wanted to get a close-up of him, and he had a heat rash in an unfortunate place oh. due to the weather. And so every time I said, look up to this balcony for your heat rash, because we were going, shooting from balconies and different angles to get this sense, almost like a Mardi Gras feeling of going through this town. And every time he looked up, he was like this. And I, and I was like, why am I not getting that, heat, that, that shot? And it was like, well, he, you know, he's very uncomfortable. And so I couldn't get his um, I'm curious to talk about scripts. Lisa, how much do your scripts evolve while you're shooting? I don't get to talk about the MPAA. Oh, you do, if you'd like to talk about that. I just have uh, uh, two things to add okay. briefly. 
One is, who is the MPAA? Because when I got my notes back after screening um, the kids, and they seemed very oddball to me. Such as? Well, they picked two scenes to pick on. They were trying to be judicious. So one had to do with gay male porn, and the other had to do with... Which has been a much talked about scene. Yeah. And, you know, that one I could understand. They thought, I I should cut back on that because it was underage kids watching it. I could live with that. That's like in the culture. Um, even though I didn't think it was gratuitous and I thought it was in context and I think this issue of context is huge yeah. and grossly just dismissed when they're evaluating things. So that's one thing. I'm like, who are these knuckleheads? Sorry. Um, it's very annoying to me. And then the other, you know, since they wanted probably to be fair and they didn't want to hear me gripe, was this straight sex scene. So it's Julianne Moore and Mark Ruffalo yeah. and they're, and it's done comedically. I mean, it's done far away and it's just a sloppy, silly, you know, Rope, and they didn't like how long I stayed on the sex position of Mark from behind Julianne. They thought that was um, going away from comedy and becoming gratuitous. Are we talking about so, the number of seconds, right? How many seconds was it and how many seconds did they want? You know, I mean, it was funny and it was a lead yeah. up into another thing. So that's, you know, the context issue of the actors are going through something, they're about to like, you know, finish their business mm-hmm. and you kind of needed to be in that moment for that length. And so mm-hmm. they were picking on that and we went back and forth and I kept, you know, lopping off frames and it's not enough and it's not good enough and they don't tell you exactly so that's very cryptic because and annoying. they don't censor you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they don't censor you but yes. I heard that there's a really good um, kind of trick that people do. I'll tell you about it later no, off no, no, camera. No, 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 come on, you have to tell no, us. No, 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 not on camera. That's no way. Our, that's that's like, that's, 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 our that's the bad part. That's <laughs> not <laughs> filming. Um, I'm going to employ that next time. So anyway, at a certain point, I just thought, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm not going to get all caught up in this. I'm not going back and forth. Like, I got to get this film out. And I just said, I'm going to do it a different way. And I regret that I did that. I mean, it's fine. It still plays as comedy. I don't think it took away anything. All the beats are still there. But now when I look at it, I'm like, what, you know, was that lazy? Was I just under the gun too much? Did I have to like rush it to the next festival or whatever it was that I was just being pressed to do? Was my editor needing to get out of the room? Why did I, you know, buckle and what was it for? So now I look at the film and I think that's a bummer. Well, that you know, that film, way. that's the permanent record One of that film. One thing I thought was interesting was uh, reading about the budget for the film and that you had, I don't know what your final I budget I taught was. you, man. It was 23 days and it was uh, oh. three and a half million that, dollars. So that's what I read. I'm just astonished you could make that film for three and a half million. That's great. And what, what I... No, also it's heard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it came together, but it was it like... But, I, but I'd heard that right. you initially had doubts about doing it for three and a half million. I did. Why? You know, I, I, I felt like I had slaved over this script. I just really cared about it, and I wasn't going to make it until I felt like it was there and ready and right. Um, I didn't want it to fail, and I knew that there was a gem in there, but it really was dependent on whether all these characters were realized, and it was cast well, and it was, you know, the piece. It wasn't one of those films like, well, you know, you have some latitude, like it could be this person or that. It was very, like, handcrafted, and it took like four and a half years or something, you know? And then I thought, okay, am I going to squander that on something that's just really impossible? Cause what figure did you think was appropriate? I think we were imagining we'd get seven million right. bucks and, you know, at least 30 days. I mean, I'd never even... Was it I'd made two by, independent films for 32 by, days. Was it financed by Focus know? or...? No, they, they, picked, they it picked it up. They picked it up. Yeah. So it was all um, equity financing. Wow. From multiple places? or Yeah, from three sources. And how difficult was that to get? You know, it was a bitch. It's really, really hard to put films together like this. Derek, yeah. Blue Valentine, yeah. where, where did the money come from for that? Finally, uh, a place called Incentive Film Entertainment. I think it was only the second film that they, they had ever made. Uh, it was three and a half million. I was able to squeeze 26 days out of it. And a month-long hiatus. We took a month off in between making the movie. Uh, I had originally, because there's a six year difference time span that yeah. happens in the film, I wanted to, I had a, wanted to wait six years between the two versions of the film, and the financier <laughs> wanted to give me a weekend. So, uh, you so settled we, on a month. We set, uh, settled on a month. But in order to get that month, you I had... So they could put on weight, look older. Yeah, yeah, just to develop some memories together. I think, you know, with, with my film, part half of the film is them getting to know each other, them falling in love, and so that, uh, Ryan and Michelle, I kept them apart, and on screen they they kind of got to know each other and uh, as these characters got to fall in love on screen 
But then the second part of the film, there had to be kind of a common memory between them. So it was really important to me to, to set up a process where they could have this memory. And the financier didn't really understand why we had to live in this house and you know for a month when they, they didn't see it going on the screen you know but to me you know uh, that those intangibles uh in performance is, is what i was really you know it, it's, it's everything to me you know so uh so i had to give up lights you know i had to give up like a lighting truck but that's better for me anyway because i i can't stand a truck you know those trucks on movie sets they just you know, all of a sudden you're shooting a shot and all of a sudden there's a truck in your shot what are you, gonna, you know I think I think in movie making, oftentimes it's like this. Uh, there's an idea of like you just keep the world out and create a world, you know. Mm -hmm. And with Blue Valentine, I didn't. I wanted to instead take my characters and just put them in 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 the real world and embrace the world and not have to lock down streets and not have to just keep the world out. I wanted the world to come into the movie. You spent 12 years. Yeah. I'm almost just amazed yeah. that you could have the, the psychic endurance to stick with these films, like Lisa yeah. did too. Yeah. What what did you do to earn a living during that? Um, I mean, people always assume directors are paid yeah. a ton of money, but if your budget's three and a half million yeah. and you spent 12 years... Yeah, I didn't make a dime on Blue Valentine. Really? I didn't make not a penny. I mean, it came down to we were exactly my fee short. Oh, uh, it's always that way. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's me. You gave up <laughs> a directing fee? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, they paid me and then I just paid it back. So, so, what, so I still have to pay taxes what, on it, you know. So, you, so I actually yeah. had to pay to make the movie. You, anyway, so what, but it was what, again. What, what, what's what the choice do you do at that moment? Like, what's the choice? You're either gonna, I'm either gonna make money for a movie that I don't make, so I won't mm. make the money, you know. Right. Anyway, so uh, to make a living in those years, I started making documentaries and commercials, and. Uh, uh, you know, I would do like a lot of these corporate documentaries for Nike or, or uh, you know, different, uh, you know, big companies. And it was great because I would just, I would, you know, I'd do like documentaries on basketball, inner city basketball players. And they just had to wear Nike shoes. And I could tell stories about, about these kids, mm -hmm. you know, that, that weren't having their stories told otherwise. And, and I think it was, so, I was so thankful, you know, like I felt cursed for all those 12 years trying to get the film made. Uh, but when I finally was able to make the film, I realized I was blessed that all those those years of struggle informed the film that I was then making. Because, you know, as a documentary filmmaker, I feel like I learned to listen. You know, I think uh, there's that archetype of the director as the megalomaniac guy, like the Cecil B. DeMille with the big megaphone, who's kind of like shouting his voice and pointing. And in documentaries, it's not like that. You know, you have to listen in documentaries. I think that megaphone in documentaries turns to your ear, and it becomes a funnel to, to you know, to and, and you you listen to the world through that. And you know, you get no take twos in documentaries. You know, you have to be sharp and instinct. So all that preparation and training in documentaries helped me make the film I wanted to make. Was that you know? a myth about the image of directing the Otto Preminger, the Eric von Stroheim, or have the types of people who become directors changed? James Cameron, he's he's that guy. He's right? making it. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think it takes all kinds, you know, mm. right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it's. Fair it's to say. It, there's all there's so many different ways to make a movie. Mm. Does anybody person, here yeah. identify being a megalomaniac? I, I I think the culture's changed so much that you kind of can't get away with that. I think there's you know we had social revolution since then and people don't like to be demeaned. You know? It's I also not the, not not exclusively directors who have this, this problem. It can be Do you think that there's, there's actors or mm, it could be someone a culture of directors that really are like that? I feel like I hear about them very rarely. We don't get to see each other working. I mean, here we are sitting, yeah. it's interesting today yeah. for this reason. But, you know, actors will tell you Gossip. something sometimes, you know, it can even be flattering, like, you know, this is the first time I've had this. And, but you know, it's hard to know. I think I hear more often that directors don't communicate. I think that's probably the complaint I've, I've heard from crew and cast. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes they, those directors are very good at what they do. So there's no, as you say, no way to be. How do you communicate? Do you rehearse a lot? Do you? No, I'm, I've always been, you know, certainly not a theatrical tradition. And I find it uncomfortable. You know, even scenes, as happens sometimes, that you use for audition pieces, you know, become tired, it seems, by the time you get to shoot them. Mm. So, but I do tend to have my own way. I mean, I'll certainly ask the actor. And if I get an actor who is very, you know, it's necessary for them, then I'll do something. But I tend to like to walk around the locations with them, the sets, um, you know, with no one around, you know, and we'll kind of sort of rehearse. Um, sometimes I've made scenes up, you know, even, you know, they're not in the film mm -hmm. and written them so we could do that or... 
sat around like this and talked about what's not in the script. Mm. Uh, is one way. And you know, one time I did. I you know, I, I actually went to a, where we had a house featuring or apartment. I actually borrowed an apartment while they were building the set, and the, the actors went there, and I had people ring up and things. You know, friends and. But they usually degenerate into a kind of humorous thing. Sometimes I'll play a part, um, you know, so as a character that's not in the script. Do you ever lose your temper? Um, no, I don't think so, not. I mean, you can be deeply upset about something, but try, you know, walk away. I you know, definitely don't want to disturb the, uh, the crew. And I think you have, you know, in the hierarchy, you have such power. And particularly if you're rather quiet and you're not someone who loses their temper, you, one sentence can devastate somebody. Mm. You know, I remember with, you know, somebody doing some minor technician or something, I said that, something like, on a quiet set, that's the third time you've walked into that lampstand or something, and there's a terrible silence, and you see the person sort of, <laughs> you know, like that, and later I've had to go and find them, so I'm terribly sorry. You know, I'm just tired, you know, I don't normally do that. You know, talk to them offset, mm. but no. So, David, <laughs> you've got into one or two battles that have had some publicity. Yeah. Do, do you regret no, that? No, of course, they're terribly embarrassing. Those are my worst moments, and they make me be more vigilant to never, ever repeat such a thing. You know, I mean, those are not things... That's not like I said, gee, yeah, that's how I work. I mean, those are just terrible, bad days for me and for the actor together and you know and, and it sort of eclipses everything else of what a great time we were having all around that and it becomes distorted because um, you know there was big casts in both in Three Kings and Huckabees and there was a lot of people having a great time and then this one incident eclipses it but no it just makes me just want to feel like just never have that kind of vibe ever and what was nice about uh, Fighter was that Mark and I were very united at the top of the food chain and that just set the tone for the whole movie yeah. Yeah. so, so oh, I'm wondering and, and I don't to you know, embarrassing, but, but, but the, you know, the conflict with Clooney did get some attention. Do you blame yourself for that? Was it exaggerated in the press? Did you then go to him afterwards and, you know, set him? Have you changed as the person? What's, what, what, what's the, the actual truth of that? About? About the conflict you had on Three Kings. Oh, you know, I think I've talked about it so much and it's such old news that I hate to even rehash it. But I think, you know, of course I went to him, you know, and of course I, you know, you try everything you can to try to make it as good as it can. I'm not a, I'm not a very, uh, I'm not, uh, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not a tactful or political person, so uh, to my own detriment. So I, so I don't try to go around behind myself and clean up, which is then when things take on a life of their own, they take on a life of their own, you know. Um, what do you think is the most important quality a director needs to have? Luck. <laughs> <laughs> Luck and timing. Patience. Patience. I, I, I think a kind of um, perceptivity, like taking the temperature all the time. You know, how fast is this moving? How slow is it moving? That kind of managerial head. And then also with the actors, knowing, like, where are they? Can I come in and and push, when is it going to, you know, be effective, when is it going to be, you know, something that backfires on me, and then I'm going to lose that little magic vibe that I've got going on with them, and it's tricky, you know. Um, How involved I, are the actors with your scripts? Um, well, on this one, I was really fortunate that Annette Benning lived in L.A. because we had zero time to rehearse, we had like, you know, less than a week, and a very short prep, so... Um, She's very dramaturgical, and I love that about her. And she wanted to meet with us and, and talk script. So she and Stuart Blumberg, the other writer and myself, met, I think, three times and really groomed through the script. And it wasn't just for her character. Like, she, it was really the glue, you know? It was like this person who had been making movies for a long time and really knew how to read and understand drama and read a script. and find the pieces and the glue Susan, and ask the right yeah. questions and it was a great it was like a shorthand for rehearsal. You think that helped that didn't hurt. What about studio notes generally? Have they hurt projects or Peter because you've done a lot of studio uh, well, notes. Well, I have well a, arrangement right up front. You know, that is that notes will be submitted. This is when you've got final cut. Yeah. Of course, but notes will be I'll accept notes but enter into no correspondence. I will never discuss what I did with them if they're huh. of use. I will use them, but otherwise it's just too tiring to say why you didn't use something. Often hard to put in words. And um, I've managed so far to, you know, to have got by with that instruction and repeated it up front. I, 
in future I'll, I'll have it in contracts, I think. I think it needs perhaps to be in writing. I, I have had to remind people. I, I'm trying to think what the last studio film you did was it Master and Commander. It was, yeah. mm. So why have you not done one since? Studios have changed. They mm. don't develop the sort of films that I'm interested in. Um, you know, it's been a big shift in that period. Mm. And, um, but, you know, I did work on, within the period between that film and this one, um, two studio pictures. But we did, they just didn't get off the ground. It didn't work mm. for various reasons. Darren, is it easier or more difficult to shoot your own material? I've only shot my own material. Um, so I don't know. I mean, um, you know, it's... it's uh, it's really hard to make films in today's world. I, you know, after doing The Wrestler, when everyone was like, why are you doing a wrestling picture with Mickey Rourke? Uh, and then it did okay. I thought when I put together Black Swan with Natalie Portman, a legitimate movie star, it would be a lot easier. But it was much more difficult than raising the $6 million we raised for The Wrestler. Um, so even having a big star attached didn't help it, it didn't help at all, you know. Um, and that's because it wasn't quite a genre film and no one really knew what it was. Um, so um, it, it, it was a real challenge. And I don't know, it's hard when you're the only person in the room who wants to make the film, which is how it's been every single time so far. And then... <laughs> oh, well, <wait> a <laughs> yeah. and, and now it's just become much worse because all the independent film money has dried up. You know, I don't think... I, it would have been. It might have been hard for all of us. That sounds like Lisa got the last of it, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, those people are still out there, yeah. but you know, but, these but it's still, it's you just, know, indie. And, they, and there's like basically one studio that's releasing these films. You know, I mean, no, you know, but it's basically Fox Searchlight, and then there's Harvey, and mm. there's a few other mm. options. But it's it's gotten so small yeah. who can release a film well mm -hmm. in this landscape that it's just it's a really tough time. Several of you write and direct, and I, and I know you've done a lot of rewriting on scripts, I don't know when you've been credited for that. Does, do you think of yourself as auteurs in that sense? And, it, and Tom, if, when you're directing somebody else's material, do you also think of yourself as an auteur or, or not? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a rewriter director, I suppose. Um, <laughs> Are you? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, Anthony Mingetta once said, was I, I was talking to him about what it was like for him being a writer director as opposed to me um talking to who anthony Mingella. oh yeah and anthony said that if you're a writer director directing is just another step on the continuum of writing whereas if you direct material that you didn't originate you're in a, a an antagonistic relationship with the text from the beginning you're totally aware of where it fails you you'll always try to pull it up you're always dealing with its flaws and it's a very combative relationship with the text and he said like you know I dream of having that relationship with my own script but I can't because I generated it I can't I can't have a highly antagonistic relationship and that's and I feel I have that antagonistic relationship with with the script and when I you know when I I mean when I first started making films as a teenager I wrote and direct all the time and I and I remember being frustrated that I couldn't see the flaws of my own writing immediately but when I start with a piece of material that someone else has generated I absolutely see the flaws the first time I read them and and, and, and I'm incredibly clear about how how it needs to be rewritten in order to um, to deal with it so I, I think I've moved away from doing the first draft of anything I, I work on because I love that clarity of being able to, to, to you know to be able to see see the weaknesses in the structure uh, which I which I and, I and I'm a great admirer of writer directors who can have that objective clarity even though they've written it themselves because I think it's um, I think it's Do you tough. feel as personally connected to the work as opposed to being a craftsman when you haven't written it yourself? Um, well I think you know for me the work I do is it's always a process of falling in love I mean the question I ask myself about whether I take on a project is can I can I fall in love with it and in order to fall in love with material you normally have to have a very strong personal connection uh, and sometimes that personal connection isn't immediately obvious up front, it reveals itself through mm -hmm. the process. And a, and a good example on the King's Speech is like, I felt so at home making this film, like I can't tell you, like, like no other piece of work I've done before. And I kept thinking, why, why is this story so familiar to me? Why am I so aware of what I want to do with it? And, and then I, I, I thought about the fact that, you know, the film's about an Australian 
uh, speech therapist dealing with an English king, and, and I was the, you know, the, the son of an Australian mother and an English father, and one of the narratives of my childhood growing up was my Australian mother um, dealing with the effects on my father of his English upbringing. And my father you know, lost his dad in the war at three and was sent to full-time boarding school at the age of five. And I had an extraordinary mother who was very public about the fact that my father had been damaged by this upbringing and wasn't going to wasn't was going to challenge it and was going to unpack it and and so of course you know for me the film is is really the story of my childhood told through the prism of a, of a, of a king and a therapist uh, and so I'm bemused when people keep going on about oh you know royal film royal film I, I, I'm kind of bemused by that because that was never my connection or never my interest my interest was um, w was on this very the Anglo Australian relationship is so specific and there are probably very few directors who could talk about that emotionally and uh, and I could so so you know I think it's it's you, you're kind whenever I, I'm reading material I'm, I'm I'm auditioning it from the point of view of can, can I fall in love and to fall in love I have to have a connection what did you change the most in that script um, there were things like uh, you know at the end of the film it was a it was a Hollywood ending where he didn't stammer he was cured he was Laurence Olivier um, and I felt that you know, I felt that there's a tendency in films about disability to suggest that there's a miracle cure, and the reality for most people living with disability is it's about ma learning to manage or learning to live with a disability, not and, and not a miracle cure. Um, and I listened to the actual, you know, the, the speech that the king makes on the outbreak of war, and it's, uh, you know, he, he if you know what you're listening to, he's still clearly a man coping with a stammer, not cured of a stammer. And I and I felt that there was a tremendous dramatic upside in embracing the idea of him never being cured because the problem with so many movies is you can't believe in the possibility of the hero's failure in the climax of the movie because you know so over and over I see a movie and I, and I, I can't believe that the hero is actually vulnerable and, and by embracing the idea that he's never cured even in the middle of you know the climax of the film you still believe in the possibility of your hero's failure which uh, I think leads it to being um, uh, you know a much more tense experience. Dave, when you did The Fighter, was there any fundamental thing you changed in the script? Well, I had to, as, as, as Tom said, I had to make it personal and, and I had to f relate to the people who I had known from my past that I related to in that script. And that's what made me want to do it, was looking at those people, as I told you earlier, and feeling like, oh, who are you? I could listen to you for three hours, you know? Um, so these are real people that we made the story on, and I have to do my past, otherwise it's like I don't know how to get out of the house. You know, so I, I have to do that, and then I, I feel I know what it is. So I worked very closely with Scott Silver, and uh, did a bunch of drafts. You know, and I, I was I was intrigued by the women. Uh, it was a more male story. I was intrigued by the sisters. There's a mother, a bleach blonde mother, and seven Melissa Leo, and seven bleach blonde sisters, all real, who are who are who are a gang. You did such a brilliant job with that because I met the people. Really? I, I, I developed it for a little bit before David took I know David you were involved over. with it, yeah. And, I mean, Melissa Leo's portrayal is unbelievable. I'm just scared people won't believe it, but, I mean, it's unreal. And so, the sisters is unreal. Did you meet the sisters before you, uh, before you did the film? Did you meet them all before you... I met them when I was crafting the film and the script, and they, they, are, they, are, they are the reason I wanted to make the film, because they remind me of my relatives, they remind me, I was a, I, I, you know, I have relatives in the Bronx and Brooklyn who, you know, you sit and listen to them and they're very amusing. They're, 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 they're very real, very human, they know how to live, and they're, they're nuts, and they're beautiful, you know, and, and, the, and I worked in these neighborhoods of Massachusetts and Maine before I became a filmmaker, because I was, was going to be a do-gooder, and I'd work in these housing projects with people very much like this. But I, so I hung out with them, we interviewed them, and the tensions in the movie, that's the movie. This bleach blonde mother, with Melissa Leo usually looks like a, a, a dust mop, and, and she walks around <laughs> in like a baggy clothes, and she's got this head of hair. She, we put her hair up the way the real Alice is, and dyed it blonde, and wore, Alice always wears tight leopard skin clothes, which half the time is why she looks like Christian Bale's character's girlfriend, which is this weird incestuous thing between them, and that makes the triangle with Mark. The other, there's two brothers and seven sisters, and, and then she has this army that's always around her. Now, we concentrated it for the sake of the film, so they were around, but they're always around, they're always drinking, they're always hanging out, and they're like this, they're intimidating. And when I interviewed the real Charlene, which was the Amy Adams role, that also I said, oh my God, you have a woman here who changes this man's life and becomes the, it, it becomes a fighting point of the whole movie because the family reacts like a gang. Mm -hmm. You know, Amy comes in and says, I don't think they're doing this right with you, which is blasphemy. 
And that's the drama of the movie. How can he keep his family's love that he's devoted to, and how can he get this woman who's a, and that's Amy playing a tough bitch against type. But when we were interviewing the real Charlene, who Amy played, and was dying, it's nothing better than getting an actress who played a Tinkerbell through five movies and is ready to play a, bi a bitch. I mean, she was, she wanted it, you know, and she had it in her. You know, she wanted to play a tough, sexy bitch with a tramp stamp, you know. Um, and, uh, and then she had a palpable chemistry with Mark. I was sitting with Charlene interviewing her in the Holiday Inn, and in comes the real family and the real Dickie, and all of a sudden the hair stand up on the back of Charlene's neck. She stands up and says, I gotta go. And I said, we just got started. She said, I gotta go. I can't be in the same room as those people. And that, that is a very alive conflict to this day in that family. And Mickey Ward is like this Buddha at the center of the whole thing. He just sits there and smiles and never, and never says an unkind word about anybody. And that's, that's oh, they, they've, they've all seen the film, right? How did they react? Well, well, that's been a process of showing them the film. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure, I mean you know, I mean, you show, I mean, right on the sets, the sisters are walking up on the sets and saying, why'd you cast her? She's not as pretty as me. I'm much prettier than her. I'm like, can we, somebody take Cindy home, please? Wow. You know, I'm going to close the set. Um, uh, I, I watched the film with Dickie, who is much harder for him. That's the Christian Bale character. As Dickie said, and it's Christian can say, the, uh, there is no, without Dickie, there's no movie because he's the big drama person he's the, who creates this, a lot of this drama with the more stable people. I had to rub his back. Uh, you know, you could just, I, so it was very hard for him. You know, because as an addict who left the past- on the set, you mean? Or no, I'm talking about when I'm watching the movie with him at a preview in New Jersey. He is, it is just so painful for him. And it was a part of his growth. A lot of the making of the film was part of people's growth. Uh, the real cop, Mickey O'Keefe, who lived all this as the trainer, Mickey Ward in his corner has a cop, and a criminal, his brother, in his corner, who hate each other. The cop hates the criminal, the criminal hates the cop. Real. And we, we used the real Mickey O'Keefe to play the cop. Who was his and, that, and, and this is this 65-year-old cop who's still a cop. And um, it was very cathartic for him. There were scenes he could have done all day where the veins were sticking out in his neck um, and he was screaming at Dickie because he has issues to this day where he feels Dickie hurt his brother. Um, but anyway, Christian, it was a very moving thing for him to understand that he came out as a human person who was lovable, you know, if you understand what I'm saying. To see that he, and that's to me the thing I'm most proud of in the movie, is you see people who are very human, very messy, and very lovable. Darren, why did you drop off the project? What happened? And, and how does it feel seeing, seeing it done by somebody else? Well, I was thrilled when they said David O. Russell. Yeah, I mean, because I'm a huge fan for many years. And, and also it was very different for a very different film for David to undertake. So I thought it was really cool that you were taking a risk and trying to do something very different. And I was excited to see how he would turn it into a David O. Russell movie. Um, I, I, well, I did The Wrestler. I mean, The Wrestler came together and I was kind of done with, you know, men who smelled of Bengay, you know, so. <laughs> and, uh, so you chose to leave. Yeah, I mean, it was, it, I, I, I was there, you know, Christian was involved, and, and, and Mark was incredibly passionate involved, and Scott Silver, who wrote the script, um, I met in film school, and I brought him on, and worked a lot on the script, and I thought the script was great, it was a fantastic project, and uh, I just realized I wasn't ready to do a male fighting trilogy or something. I, I had done, you know, my combat movie but, but and I it, wanted to do... But does it hurt if you feel frustrated when you see somebody else's version of the film? I, it wasn't when it was David, because I'm yeah. a fan, and so I was excited to see him take that material and turn it into his own film. Because I knew he... It, it's like people have always talked if there's competition, and, it, you know, I always talk about my Sundance experience where me and Lisa, she was there with High Art, I was there with Pi, and... Um, uh, I was there with my film brother Ty too. Were you really? <laughs> Talked about. I was okay. really mad at you guys. I mean, uh, <laughs> they got the attention. Yeah, yeah um, but all the. I mean, I, I became I got lasting friendships from filmmakers there. And when I was in film school, it was extremely competitive, and people were at their necks. And then I went to Sundance, where the competition meant something. And you know, I'm still friends with a lot of those filmmakers that were there. And um, you know, I always talk about if. You know, if all of us were to have a script, I think most of the voices here would make very different films, which would be an interesting project mm -hmm. just to see what we all came up with. And so I, I never was competitive with what David would do. I was just excited to see the film he was going to turn it into. Darren, do you think people need to go to film school to be good directors? Uh, I, you know, I think, I'll, I mean, you know, every time you're on set, especially when you're young, 
you learn something, right. you know. Um, a lot of people say they learn everything on set, all the skills. You do have. learn a lot on set, but uh, you know what came out of film school for me was meeting a lot of the people I ended up collaborating for years with. So it's I don't know where I'd be. Yeah, I mean Matthew Libatique, my DP on four of my five films I met there, producer I met there, Scott Silver, the writer I met there. So, you know, those that's just kind of a little AFI mafia that I've been able to sort of hang out with for years. So, mm -hmm. you do get that. I, and that's what I tell when I go back to film schools. I'm like, you the films you are making aren't good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and as a film student, you think they're the greatest things of in the course, world, but in a course. few years you'll look back and realize, you know, what type yeah. of shit you were doing. But the most important thing is, is each other. And if you can create, you know, unity and groups, right. because film is a collaborative medium and you need other people to work with. To so you look back at your own films and think they're good? Well, it was funny. I just kind of did one of those um, where you sit there and they DVD. show clips from your movies at oh. a, in front of people and mm -hmm. stuff. And I mean, they showed a clip of Pi. I was like humiliated, you know? <laughs> but you know, people still come up to me and like it and it means something to them. So it's good, but it's kind of like, you know, when you find your poetry from when you were 14, it's, it's really humiliating. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think yeah. what, that's interesting because you went to AFI as a director, right? Yeah. I went to Columbia in New mm -hmm. York and it doesn't let you say, what, declare what you're gonna do there. Right. So you go and you have to go through screenwriting and producing and directing. And I found like what was really valuable for me, especially when I went to film school, which was kind of at the height of the American indie, you know, moment of the 90s, um, was that I felt like writing was really my ticket, like knowing how to write a screenplay and then, you know, then going off and making this low budget uh, feature, high art, was really the only way I felt like I was going to be able to get in and become a filmmaker. So I, I find it kind of interesting that James Shame has taught you mm. and he's now releasing um, kids who were right. What? It wasn't like it was yesterday. I'll tell you. Well, <laughs> I what, what, what did he teach you that really stayed with you? Um, you know, he he was he's sort of very strict about budgets, and um, he always said, "Make the budget your aesthetic," and that was kind of the mantra at the time. It was like we all felt like we were going to go out there and write you know, these feature scripts and get them made. We were going to scramble around and get people to invest and make them for half a million bucks, which a lot of us did. I did it. And um, so to have somebody who was really entrenched in the uh, independent world at the time, he was, he had that company, Good Machine, and he was just starting with Ang Lee and he was making these, you know, small independent films. So to think about a script and think about the means by which I was going to get it made and how to direct it and you know, to kind of preconceptualize it in my head, that was a very instrumental thing. What movie? You know, it stayed with me. Thank God, I like had that in my head because how else would I have made a film in twenty three days? That's kind of an insane proposition. I was going to say, what what film inspired you to be to want to write and direct before school? Was there a formative sort of film that shaped your artistic vision? You know, there was a lot of films. Picnic at Hanging Rock. One you know, I was just thinking about that because <laughs> I, I, I was, and I was going to ask you how you feel about that. I, me, I remember as a child going to see it with my mother in Slough, which is like the Cleveland of England, as we know. And it's where it's where the English office is set. Is it, yeah, that's right. Yes, <laughs> and, uh, it's a sort of. Gosh, I hope this isn't shown in England because it's kind of like a joke. Yes. <laughs> and seeing Picnic at Hanging Rock and being simply astonished by it. And I'm wondering when you look back at that, have you seen it? in recent years, and, and, and when you look back at your own, uh, your own earlier films, do you have any regrets? Do you have any favorites? I, I think, uh, you know, I mean, it's always a strange relationship, I think, with past work, as you were saying. I think for me, the curious thing was seeing it with my children as they grew up, you know, and they would hmm. find, you know, in the, in the, at that time, a you know, video and say, Dad, this is, this, this is one of yours, you know, how, can I see it? And then the strange thing of wanting them to like it, which is <laughs> And you would know when they'd say, you know, I'm going to bed, I'll see the rest of it tomorrow. You know? oh. <laughs> uh, but I think, I think the relationship is for me that I'm more fond of those films that, that didn't really work. And to a degree, the ones that have been successful critically and commercially, which is, you know, it's not all that many, they don't belong to you in a way anymore. I think they, they, they become sort of the public property. So the ones you're left with are those sort of troublesome. Which ones? <laughs> well, Is you know. Is there one I, that you have a particular fondness for? Um, I think I'll keep that to myself, but I, I, 
I, I think that there are a couple of them that I do, one in particular that I still work on in my mind, often on long plane flights. Mm. Um, and it's, it was essentially the ending, but of course that means it was how I got there. And so I'll find myself uh, sort of opening up a kind of uh, mental cutting room and thinking, could I have done that? And of course you can do anything sitting there thinking, could I have shot that? Could I have had another actor? And I, could, I never solve it. Uh, it no, you're away. not talking about a recent film, you're talking about a film that made some yeah, time ago. No, no, and you still go back to it, it's, that's so interesting. Do, do the rest of you revisit your films? David, you do? Oh, sure. You're never done uh, making them, in a way. I mean, I mean, you, you stop because they make you stop, or you have to stop. But, uh, yeah, my son likes it's one of my early, my earliest, my first film, and I, that was, it was like watching it with him was like sticking, it was so painful to me, to, 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 to see all the, the mistakes I felt I'd made. And, uh, yeah. And then, and then, fortunately, some life inside the film took over halfway through, and I was like, "Ah, oh, this isn't so bad," you know, like halfway mm -hmm. through, and I could live with it. But um, so, I think yeah, it's important. I think the mistakes are the important. Monkey, you know, how old is your? But, but I think that one of the key things about being, as you asked earlier about what it is like being a director. <coughs> for me, it's you know, you're looking through the camera and you're seeing what you're shooting, and you're seeing another version running alongside. I mean, so you know, for, I, I, it's like you can watch two things at once. You can see. You're, you're, you're imagining the other version that you could be about to do on the next take while also watching what you're currently watching. And so, of course, that goes into films you have finished. You, you, can, you can watch it while also playing this alternative version or experimenting this alternative version in your, in your head. And the ability to run the two versions is probably a very key aspect of being well, a director. We're talking about sort of what, what, it, what quality it takes to be a director. Is there any particular aspect that you feel great confidence in or that you lack confidence in? Because one of the things that sort of struck me is um, there's so many different skills you need. You need to understand a screenplay. You need to understand acting. You need to understand camera. And um, we, we did the Actresses Roundtable. Nicole Kidman was there, and she said she'd actually like to direct. But she looks at someone like Jane Campion, who grew up with a camera. And, you know, Nicole said, I didn't. I don't see the world through camera. It's the one area that you f wish you had more skill in. Um, I don't know, it's a good question. I mean, I, I, I mean, the, the things I love, I, lo I love composing images, well, you know, lo working with actors and composing with images. And what's funny is I'm not, I'm not an avid stills photographer, but at the moment it's a, it's a film camera and it's a shot in service of the story. I, I, I absolutely love that process. And, and so I'm incredibly happy on Shoots, and I always think what a what a, what a strange and complex, you know, accident it is that, that my great pleasures come from this incredibly complex machine um, that that involves. And is there any area where you don't feel great pleasure? Well, I, uh, I, you know, going back to the writing thing, I think because I because I tend to need to start with existing <coughs> material that you know I I I I look at uh, people who can generate their own material, and and it would be it would be great to be able to. Um, completely self-generate and not have to go out into the world to find the stories in order to keep going. And I, and I think that that process of every time you feel like you're starting again, because you because to to, to find that special connection with a piece of material um, that will that will drive you forwards, you, you you have to you have to rebuild that. And there is no structure in place that you know guarantees that you can keep finding these stories that you, you want to tell. Um, and that would be you know. Wonderful that there was a way of. <laughs> Peter, what about you? Is there, I mean, you've done so much mm. and have shown such good so many. Is there one area that you actually feel vulnerable in, in as a director? Oh, writing, I think. You know, yeah. I've written scripts, I've done original scripts, and I've done shot other people's scripts. And you're always writing something, as has been said today, I think, from most directors, you're rewriting or trying something. But um, it isn't my strongest suit. You know, I would rather I was a better writer. But I think I've improved over the years, and by reading more, I think reading helps writing a great deal. Mm. What um, do you read? Oh, very widely. I would say mainly history. Um, but, you know, I'll set myself goals sometimes, you know, like Proust. You know, I sort of had a gap, and I thought, it's like a comedy joke. I know all about Proust, but nothing about it, mm. really. And so I bought, you know, the seven volumes or something. And I can't say I enjoyed it all. You know, well, you've read them all. Yeah, yeah. Mm. In the original French, of course. Well, you know, that's my next challenge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I... Uh, By the way, there was a great... Uh, one of the most interesting things I ever came across, you know, Harold Pinter did a, a Proust screenplay, which, which is truly magnificent, and wasn't filmed. 
uh, he and Joseph Losey were going to do it. Mm. Um, but for some reason, they couldn't get the rights. Visconti had the rights and a screenplay, but couldn't get the money. And it ended up being shot by Volker Schlondorf in not of a course. very good yeah. version. The, the Vis- I read the, the Pinter mm. version, which I thought was one of the best scripts I ever read. And then I read the Visconti version. Mm. Um, and it's a masterpiece. And it's extraordinary to read these two versions where one is, my God, this is wonderful. And then, mm. and then it's God w- at work, mm. you know. Mm. Um, last question before we wrap up. Any, do you have any films you wish you'd made that you haven't been able to? Lisa? Oh, God. I've had tons to say about everything else. But there, <laughs> I, I'm really... Um, I'm not longing to do something that's out there that I, I can't get my hands on. I've really generated these these films that I've made and they've been stories that have, you know, kind of been burning in me. So I'm I'm just starting to turn my attention outward and say, well what okay, what books do I love? Like what could I imagine adapting? But it's a weird transition not to turn in, you know, to look and how do you what do you look for when you look out and, and what you know, those things like um what Tom was talking about, you know, how do I internalize this so that I fall in love with it, you know, and it breaks my own heart, even though it's not generated from my own experience or imagination. And um, I don't know that that's always instantaneous. I think sometimes there's a, there's a process involved in that, and I'm sort of learning what that might be, like what questions to ask and, and how hard to chip into things to, to maybe open that and make that happen. So it's tricky. I'm finding it. I'm finding this um, like that's my project right now to see if I can find source material or look outside myself. David, what about you? There's a lot of things that I've written that I I I don't think I quite got the way I wanted them to be, and I know that I hope to return to them and still make them. I'm sure a few people feel that way here. You know, you're going to come back to that, circle back to it, and get it right, and. Um, it's become clear, as Darren was saying, in this climate, you're going to have to find the way to do that um, and be very... You really think this climate is that tough, do you? For I would say yeah. that, yeah. yeah. Is, every, is every film around the table an independent movie? Yes, yeah, ma'am. Yeah. That's, I mean, that tells you the story. That, that's and that was the last time I did director's table was the opposite. Was it? Oh. Yeah. Which was how long ago? Like? Except I was the only independent. It was the two years ago. Right. The Wrestler yeah. it was yeah. all studio that films. Was on that round table, was it? It was Ed Zwick, Ron Howard... Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood. Mm. It was, you know, yeah. Did everybody here uh, make films with equity financing? or But you made yours with Searchlight, well, right? No, no, we got picked up. Well, we did in the end, but we were independent two weeks out, and then the money fell apart. Mm. And so we had to find an equity partner to pay half. And How do you deal with the emotion of that? Because I couldn't deal with that stress. It was a nightmare. I mean, uh, you know, it was... I, I'm. <laughs> Like three weeks before the money fell apart, I sat with the investor and he kind of, I said, where does the money come from? And he basically described a Ponzi scheme to me. <laughs> <laughs> His name I, wa- to I be walked out and I, call, I called, you know, my lawyer and I was like, what's going on here? Uh, I'm a little nervous. And literally a week later it fell apart. And, and then we were blessed by a company, Cross Creek, which is a great equity company that was just emerging, showed up like, mm-hmm. like you know, Mary Poppins. Mm-hmm. And then Fox actually like, finally... Came in, Peter, so. is there a project that you wish you, you could make that you haven't been able to? Uh, I've got one that I haven't been able to because I haven't, can't get it right. So it's an original screenplay that I drag out every time I'm in between films. I twice hired writers to work on it. Mm. Um, I've worked on it and I've got about six versions of it. it just What's that about? <laughs> now that would really curse it. Really, it's just a rough idea of what it's. Sort of Absolutely genre. not. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know the project, though, actually. Oh, well, I think I know one of the writers who works on it. Oh, well, possibly. Uh, and, and uh, Tara, what about you? I mean, when you were doing Blue Valentine, was that 12 years with nothing else on your mind? or No, I mean, I watched the movie in my mind every day for those 12 years. I storyboarded 1,200 shots, wrote 66 drafts, you know. When 66 the, drafts? Yeah, and when the time came to shoot, we threw, I just... To me, the danger with Blue Valentine is that it would be uh, stale by the time I finally had the opportunity to shoot it, you know. So I threw everything away, you know, and uh, just asked the actors to surprise me. You know, we we wouldn't, I, I would be so disappointed in them if they did the dialogue that was on the page, you know. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah, so I've been working on another film called The Place Beyond the Pines for about three and a half years. I'm nervous that 
it's like I don't want to wait 12 years, but I also want it to you be. Go uh, eight and a half. Yeah, I want it. <laughs> you, know, you know, my favorite cook is that guy uh, Justin Wilson, the guy with the suspenders and the belt. You know, and he's, he says uh, his, in his cookbook, it says the longer it cooks, the better it tastes. You know, so I just I like things that take time. You know, but I, I hope I don't have to wait we 12 years for everything. You know. We don't have to. Tom, what's next for you? Well, I fell in love with the project in 2000. In fact, flew myself out to LA for the first time to to try to you know to get hold of the right to direct it and. Ten years later, it, it's locked in a studio that has no desire to make it, oh. and I'm and I'm I'm still trying to extricate myself. Isn't there some rule that if they don't do anything for five years, you can actually get the script? Yeah, but you still have to pay, you know, the cost Someone has against to buy it, it, out. you know. Yeah, and um, uh, I mean, what you know, what I th it's what strikes me about listening to everyone's stories is, is, in a way, what what's slightly happening. I think is that the is that all all, all our films sound like they can do well financially. I mean, when you actually you know, look at them, it doesn't feel like any of them are actually really tough commercial sort of no-go areas. But it feels like the, 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 the risk is being put back on the filmmaker. In other words, we have to take the risk, we have to do it for these micro-budgets. And then, and then if they're successful, the people, you know, people who participate haven't necessarily had to shoulder as much risk. And mm -hmm. I think that's partly one, one of the things that's happened, is that, is that, we, you know, is that we're having to we're having to take more risk by working in this way. In the, and I think the audience is still there. I mean, I don't know if around the table everyone else finds that, but friends, acquaintances, or you read it in the newspaper, people are saying there's not much on mm -hmm. that interests me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's because in, you know, this kind of, one, the gold rush toward the, you know, these monster films that are really, mm -hmm. you know, children's films or family mm -hmm. films, the tent poles. Uh, there's so much money to be made. It, there, there's been a gold rush, and it's affected way right down through to the smaller uh, financial people. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, on the other hand, is a deep conservatism that's crept in, which has led to genre filmmaking. It seems to be safer. You know, you can predict the audience for the horror film. But meanwhile, in the area they call, you know, sort of adult drama, a phrase that was never used in, in the bulk of my years. Maybe. Well, for a different reason. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's right. Special film. Uh, the, the audience is still there, and I think that it's what an opportunity, for I would think, for a, for a young Weinstein to kind of get in out there now and sort of find new ways, you know, obviously the internet or whatever, to go to that audience who are at home watching DVDs or whatever they're doing. But... And they, you know, they really get out. And I think that's quite really huge, that audience. So it's, it's, in other words, what's happened so fast for us cannot have happened to human beings so fast. Yes, it may evolve over the next 50 years that people look at films in a different way. These kind of movies are in museums or something. But uh, it's not happening, it's not going to happen in two or three, four, five years. So, you know, I think we here have something the public want. Mm -hmm. That's how to get it to them. They had to make it first and then how to... Mm -hmm. I think it's going to shift back. I, mm. I feel it like it just has to shift back because there is, you know, I'm, I'm amazed. People just, they keep saying, oh, everybody's staying home and watching TV on their computer. And it's like, yeah. people yeah, just love to go to the cinema. That's oh. just no, no, no. I, 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 there were many films that came out this year that if they had this video on demand, Dan, you know, when, I, when I, I was really aware of the film because they were promoting it, I think that's an answer, too, is where you can watch it at home for a different price or yeah, something. Not, I, mean, I, I think it can change saying, the way. You think that's, that will happen? I, I think, I think like going that. to the cinema now is becoming more of an experience now, you know, where it's like it's something special, like going to a ride. Yeah, I, but I, yeah. then I, I'm a parent now, so it's a very, I'm not mm. 20 going to the movies all the time, but I would love to have gone a lot of these films on the same day. So I, I think that's going to start... I don't know how that'll work economically. It seems it, it, like it should, work. You know, Darren made that point about competitiveness when he was at film school. And the, the thing that strikes me about getting to know directors now is that, is that the truth is there's always space for another good film. You know, and and like in a week where there's a number of good films, I'll just go to the cinema more. And if there isn't, I just won't. And so it's it's yeah. not like there's some limit on mm -hmm. on the good films that can be made. Yeah, that's um, that's what I'm saying. So if it's there and people are hearing about it yeah. and there's buzz, people are going to be inconvenienced and go because people have an appetite and I think that just doesn't go away no matter where you see it but I do believe the cinemas will prevail. Yeah but what about promotion? What about distribution? And the, well then there's, there's no the, the p and a, a issue thing but that that's is a little outside of the of normal convention. We used to make we were during the mix we were like we should be doing an iPhone mix cuz we realized you know most people will be watching yeah. it <laughs> on their iPad <laughs> unfortunately oh but that's I think if you yeah. you know I mean more people have watched our films on at home video than yeah. any way else, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, you know, none of us really pay attention to that mix, really. So, 
You just you had to do yet another version of a sound. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs>